Okay, now that we're recording this, I'll again reopen, I'll open the meeting. Welcome everyone. And we note one apology that I'm aware of, which is Ruka Moana Schelphausen. Um, the rest of us, I think, are here. So on that basis, do we need to, a motion to um, accept that, Matt, or we just- Ah, uh, yes. Uh, yes, we do. So or, I'll move that we accept Ruka's apology. Mr. Chair? Yeah, I'm sure I saw Garth seconding it. All in favour? Aye. Done. Uh, that takes us then on to the confirmation of the status of the agenda. Um, as I indicated, I think there are three items that I would like to add onto the closed agenda. And these I have already mentioned to Carol. So we may be in a position to um, have at least some discussion around it. One is the status of the uh, Narawakia wastewater treatment plant in terms of the letter that we received um, from the regional council. The second is uh, the correspondence with water care services over one of the contracts, which Carol, you've subsequently provided us some information today. And thirdly, I think it would be helpful if we just had a brief conversation around the three waters update and where that's at with the uh, thought to bring a more substantive paper to the next meeting. Are there any further items people wish to include on the agenda for today? Carol? Um, just at the end, if we had time, um, Waterkey was going to just talk a little bit more about their procurement processes, and we were just going to give, wanted to give the boards a head up on the Te Kaufata, um Water Renewals Project that we plan to circulate a paper out of cycle to the board. Okay, is that in relation to the letter that was circulated yesterday? No, no, this, this is a new item that we couldn't quite get um, in time for the agenda to close. Okay, is that in the open or closed? Closed. Closed. Okay, can you again prompt me if I forget? Thank you. All right, with that, if there's no other changes, then we again do we resolve to confirm the status of the agenda? Oh, yes. I'm happy to move. Do I have someone second? Gavin, all in favour? Right. Right, that takes us to disclosures of interest. Are there any changes anyone has? from that which we have previously advised and is circulated. So, um, Matt, could I just ask, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, Matt, could I just ask that you talk to Ruku um, about just noting her recent appointment uh, to the Three Waters group? That should be noted. Yeah. Right. And Matt, um, the changes I advised at the previous meeting haven't been incorporated in the disclosures of interest that have been circulated for this meeting. Oh, okay. Um, can I just ask Jackie, was it were yours? Yeah, sorry about that. Um, the key one, which is of relevance, although not a conflict, is that I am acting CE of... Um, Parafenua District Council at the moment, and therefore am involved in Three Waters discussions and some of the um, um, interactions with government at the moment, but uh, certainly not a conflict. Right. That being the basis, then do we need to move any other motions there in terms of disclosures of interest, Matt, or is that um, sufficient? No, you don't. That's fine. All right. That takes us, I think, Carol, to the action, to the minutes first. So we have a sure. minutes circulated. Sorry. Yes. Minutes. Yes. Would you like me to um, just sort of read out some of those up updates that I've put in there or take that as read? Uh, updates in the minutes or updates on the action register? So I've got updates on the action register. Um, a, a few of them, the, there are papers um, in this meeting that will answer them and a couple of them just have some status comments, updates in there. Right um, 
Yeah, I was just about to say that do we need to move the um, confirm the minutes from the previous meeting first before we then take the actions arising? Yes. Okay, uh, they, they've been circulated. Are there any changes required from those that are included in our papers today? If not, could someone move? Kevin, seconded. Garth, all in favour? All right. Right, Carol, I think that takes us then to the actions register. Okay, um, sorry. So, yes, the first one, um, there'll be a paper and text on that on the Chicago water take, giving you an update. Um, the REITs, then, with the Huntley Wastewater Treatment Plant, there is a paper in that. Disclosure is interesting, that's been updated. The circulating the link um, of the Tomato Arawai webinars to the community. So, um, we have, I have forwarded that back to Sam, our EWI and um, Community Partnership Manager to distribute to the appropriate audiences of parties. We've also um, created a separate section on our public website that talks about Tomata Ata Wire and has the link to where the webinars are and there's various information on that and we've also circulated it via email out to anyone in our community who has um, subscribed to one of our, our news which we've got about 5,000 members so there's, there's various ways that that's gone out there. Um, the Next action about the small water scheme. So I've got, no, I've got that being due with May, but just to let you know that we have made a number of inquiries trying to identify what non-council small water schemes are out there. Um, what we've found out today is that we've got 30 halls, 30, uh, 27 marais and 10 schools that are not on a public reticulated supply. And through the regional council, we've identified um, another 400 and something um, consents, with the vast majority of those being categorised as agricultural dairy and not necessary for potable use. But of course, they may choose to actually feed a house. Um, I've been in touch with Waikato Regional Council. They've provided me further data. Um, they don't collect the data about how many houses um, are on a farm. So they're a little bit blind as well, just how many of their water take consents may actually have multiple houses and be categorised as a drinking water supplier under the new standards. Um, <clears throat> the rapid antigen testing, there's some information on that on the March report of MATS and, um, and also about the COVID. I'll just put some comments um, and, and the actions as well on that. Good, no thanks Carol. Um, any questions or comments in relation to what Carol's just indicated? Or, no, I think the key point there is that all of the issues that are due to be dealt with are in fact in other agenda papers. So on that basis, then if there's no further comments, um, could I have someone move that we receive the actions report? Garth, this time, seconded Gavin, all in favor? Aye, right. carried. That takes us then to the reports. And Carol, just to note that you've got a wish to bring the Huntley Wastewater Treatment Plant upgrade, which is shown as 6.5, up and handle it after 6.1. Is that correct? So if we're all comfortable with that, we'll, we'll take report 6.1, then deal with 6.5 as it follows logically from the 6.1. So, um, the first one, district plan presentation, Ohinawai. Carol, are you um, presenting that? Um, we've got Carolyn um, here to present that to us. I'll let Carolyn introduce herself. Um, um, over to you, Carolyn. And Matt, are you able to share the screen or did you want, or are you happy to do that, Carolyn? I'm happy to do that because I'll, Carolyn, I'll um, yeah. skip through. And Carolyn, just because of our limited time, um, the, the conversation I had with Carol was that I think you can safely assume we've read the um, slides, great slides, and our focus ought to be on the three waters um, section. Yeah, appreciate that. Um, Morena Koutou, everyone. I am Carolyn Ratt. I'm a policy planner who's um, assisting Waikato District Council with um, all aspects of the district plan review. And I appreciate, as you've said, um, Chair, that you've got a very full agenda, so this is going to be pretty quick and focus on the areas that you're probably most interested in. Okay, so we'll skip through the first ones. Um, probably the most interesting uh, is this one, and this just shows the extent of the Ohiniwai decision. Um, so what's happened is that 
all of the appeals have been resolved now. So this, as I'll get to the last slide, is all, in all intents and purposes operative in terms of Section 86 of the Resource Management Act. It does require council's seal to make it um, to be put on the website as operative, but for um, inquiries or resource consents, the provisions are now operative. The, as you all know where Ohini Wai is, you've got Huntley to the bottom, you've got um, my mouse, State Highway here, the expressway, you've got the river over here. Now it's everything that's grey, so north of Tahuna Road and Lumsden Road and Bellini Road, it's not the grey down south of Tahuna Road. That's Future Urban Zone and that came out via the decision that was recently released in January. So for the purposes of this, it's just this, this piece in grey north of Tahuna Road. Um, as, you'll, as you can see, there's three precincts. There's uh, industrial, which is the purple. The yellow is medium density residential and this kind of uh, brownie red is business. Um, so you've seen all this, I won't go into that at all. That's the staging plan, that's the objectives. Um, it's quite strong um, quite incentive to deliver the structure plan in terms of the provisions. Um, and probably this is getting into the more interesting stuff for you. So the staging and sequencing is very strong policy direction for staging of subdivision development and infrastructure and of most um, import here is table OH1, which is Ohiniwai, that's the prefix for it because it's a special purpose zone, three waters, and there's a, quite an extensive table there um, with upgrade or infrastructure required and the staging and sequencing of that. So as I've said here, there's a very strong objective and policy direction that development must be serviced for three waters and it be available prior to development. And as I've said, that table is the key as it sets out the timing and expectations for servicing of three waters. So this one I thought you'd be quite interested in. Sorry, you don't have this in your slide, but I can make it available. Um, this is a policy that's in those provisions and it says all development, it's policy seven, must be connected to a reticulated public water supply except for on-site water supply for initial industrial development of factory stages, F1 and F2. Now going back to that um, staging diagram, F1 and F2 is just at the, the most northern part of the page. So it's basically saying that everything other than those two factory stages needs to be uh, connected to a reticulated public water supply. The next one, which I think you'll find interesting, is the second one, which is avoid. So that's, a, that's not negotiable. That's a very strong policy directive. Avoid development not connected to a public reticulated wastewater network, except for F1 and F2, those factories. So they're allowed to go ahead, but everything else subsequent must be connected to a public reticulated wastewater system. And then you've got three, um, which provides a little bit more information. Um, those, uh, the wastewater in particular, it must be able to accommodate the stage of development. It needs to have obtained all the necessary resource consents. Now, this is interesting, and you don't normally see this in district plan provisions, but because um, there was the, the Huntley wastewater treatment plant issue, the panel, and, and it has been confirmed through appeals, um, that any consents, and be it regional or district plan, it needs to comply with those resource consents. Um, and it needs to be certified by Waikato District Council as being able to comply with the conditions. So the next three, just look at each of water, wastewater and stormwater. This was, water in particular was a key issue that came up in the hearing. And as I've said, um, initial industrial development and in the factory F1 and F2 can have on-site water supply, but everything else beyond that must be connected to a reticulated public water supply. In terms of wastewater, this was a key issue, particularly for Guaikato Tainui, but also the Regional Council. And again, uh, F1 and F2 can have on-site treatment and disposal of wastewater, but as I've said, there's that very strong policy that anything subsequent um, development must be avoided until it can connect to the reticulated wastewater network. And for stormwater, this one came in through appeals, so it actually wasn't in the decision, but it did was introduced through appeals. 
stormwater management must avoid any discharges to the existing regional drainage system. Again, F1 and F2 has a bit of a pass. Um, they can temporarily discharge stormwater into the Bellini drains. But beyond any development beyond that F1 and F2, it's got to be via the wetland park and or central park to Lake Rotokaua. And what's quite interesting is that in the zones, oh sorry, in the precincts, um, so business, industrial or residential, any permitted land use requires a two-step treatment train for stormwater with the first step being on site. Um, skip through the next, probably nothing of interest there for you. Obviously, happy to take questions on that. Um, but the only other things to note, and in rounding this off, the, as I've said, the provisions are deemed to be operative now under Section 86F of the RMA. The Clause 17 approval, which is council seal, still needs to be done, and there's a meeting on the 22nd of March um, for council to do that. There are a couple of privately owned sites for sale, so it's not all owned by Ambry. Um, so we will be getting quite a lot of inquiries, I suspect, about those two sites in particular. Uh, that's on Lumsden Road. At some point, a plan change will need to be done to integrate and make the provisions consistent because they came out earlier than the actual decision. They aren't consistent, but that's okay. They're completely self-contained. They're ring-fenced. That's okay for the time being. And the only other thing I'd like to add is that it is completely different, separate to the fast-track consenting process for the foam factory. And that's all I've got, but happy to take questions. Excellent. No, thanks for that. Um, certainly a very comprehensive uh, PowerPoint in, in full and uh, it, it's an exciting stage of that whole development. So with that, let's uh, open it up for any questions or comments from any of the board. Uh, no comments to make. Looks like you've done a wonder. Oops, there we are. Jackie. Oh, kia ora. Thank you, Carolyn. And I'm not sure if this is a question for Carolyn or whether it's something that um, Carol or Gavin can pick up. Uh, but where are we at with the development agreements with Sleepyhead around connection um, and provision of services? Would you like me to answer that, Gavin? Um, so at the moment, um, there has been some, some interaction with Sleepyhead. They've shared, us, shared with us their um, indicative high-level time frame on each of the stages. And um, we've talked about Sleepyhead actually funding a role within council that can um, act as that liaison between Sleepyhead and um, council. And looking at that in our growth team, and I think they're currently looking at um, whether they're put that out in the market or certainly getting ready to go out in the market. So we are, are in discussions, very early stages, um, and it will get discussed a little bit more, I guess, in light of that, um, the Huntley paper that's coming up next as well. Jackie, does that answer your query? Yeah, it'll probably come up in the Huntley, Huntley paper. I guess what I'm interested in is um, it's the prioritisation of the, the major Huntley upgrade and reconsenting and the timing of that, given all of the other pressures that WDC are facing around compliance. Um, and I guess the, the desire by Sleepyhead to accelerate those works to enable their development and us just having to really think about how to balance that. Absolutely. Because the last thing we want to be doing is um, inhibiting development for the obvious reasons. Right. If, is there any more comments? Oh, Mr. Chair, just on that, um, I think that'll come up when we consider that other paper. Yeah. Um, and can I just say uh, we should not uh, take away Carolyn's done a great job in terms of presenting this information um to many audiences i know and uh so i think the quality of it is is really good so carolyn don't take anything away from that that you're not getting many questions i think it's because you've done as the chair said you've done a good job in terms of how it's been presented so um thank you for that in thank fact you. the chair might go further and say you've done a superb job in terms of putting the presentation together so uh um it was yeah it was it was good to see 
good to see the development that's happening there. So I think if there's no further um, comments to be made, we've got a recommendation there. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, Jackie. Um, the two treatment train requirements for stormwater, is that required elsewhere in the district and has that sort of standard come through the district plan? Uh, through you, Chair. Um, through you, Mr. Chair. No, it's quite unique, and it's come about through the appeals to Ohaniwai. So you won't see this uh, approach anywhere else in the district plan. The decision. Mm -hmm. Right. If there's no further comments, then we've got a recommendation there that the district plan presentation Ohaniwai be received. Do it. Moved by Gavin, seconded by someone, Garth, there you are. All in favour? Aye, right. thank you. And Carolyn, many, many thanks. Right, I think that takes us to the next agenda item. Sorry, I'm just trying to find the page. Bear with me half a moment, but we're taking the 6.5 Huntley Wastewater Treatment Plant Upgrade now, which I think is on page 181. Now, who's presenting that? Um, I can start with some high level um, summaries and anything more technical I'd ask um, water care to assist with. Um, Keith wrote this paper. He, he unfortunately can't be here today. Um, so keeping in mind what Carolyn has just um, taken us through with her honey wine, um, and particularly the need that anything beyond the first two stages must be connected to the public um, reticulated water and wastewater system. Um, we've got the immediate need with Huntley to look at the existing non-compliance. We've got a formal um, warning from Waikato Regional Council um, on the audit that occurred over the 2020-21 period. Um, the, we've got a full upgrade um, budgeted for 47 million for this plant, but not until 2026 to 28 financial years, as that coincides with when the current discharge consent expires at the wastewater plant in Huntley in 2029. So um, we've asked Watercare for an interim solution to bring the plant back into compliance. And they have come with the attachment to this paper um, on the moving bed biofilm reactor and MBBR is what has been suggested if we want to achieve compliance um, in the near future. And that's at an estimated cost of a million dollars and that's not currently budgeted in our LTP. So um, with the Hiniwai coming on board, we would expect CP here to pay the, um, the, the pipe, the conveyancing cost to connect that to Huntley, but there would also be upgrading the plant itself if we were to look to move to the upgrade as opposed to the interim um, million dollar improvement. With the MBBR, if we put that in, um, when we upgrade the plant, it's likely then to become redundant, the interim um, improvement. So that would be a sunk cost. So we obviously also need to um, engage further with Waikato Regional Council to talk about what plans and what direction from the board gives us today that we look to head in the timing of those and also do further our negotiation um, and working with Sleepyhead on a development agreement and working with finance also to understand how, how we're going to fund that and what um, constraints we have on anything that might not be funded by Sleepyhead. And there's also the wider um, looking at more housing under the Kianga Aura in Huntley as well. So there's, there's a whole host of things to consider in this one. Matt, was there anything that you wanted to add to this? Not, not really, probably, Carol. It's probably a pretty good description of the situation and the solution we put forward. Obviously, um, the recommendation was around uh, compliance uh, in the short term, but obviously recognising that the with the longer term solution uh, not being now, but being within a reasonable period of time with the development, that, that's why we suggested a considering of, of change of approach. I don't know, Richard, is there anything you wanted to add? No, no, I think um, Carol summed it up pretty well. And I, th I just think she did stress too that the connection of the wastewater from a Hinawai to the new, the plant, you know, has not, there's very, very little detail in that and it was always going to be done by them. And that probably should be done in conjunction with a water connection of some sort too. Okay, well, look, thanks for that introduction. Gavin, I see you've got your hand up, so we'll pass across to you. 
So look, um, probably if you were Keith or uh, Matt, you'd probably say someone put a spanner in the works for this report and that was me. Um, the reason being that the recommendation was to proceed with the interim, get the compliance issues addressed. Mm -hmm. um, and what I did was just ask Keith around, are we spending a um, million dollars that we can reuse the equipment for the longer term solution? Um, or is this, a, is this a situation where we should go to the regional council, have that conversation, the bigger picture, um, and talk about the major upgrade that needs to happen, bearing in mind that is going to have to come forward. Um, Councillor Patterson, I'm sure, will back me up on this. There has already been conversations at the council table around the need for this work to come forward to facilitate the growth um, and the development of a Hinawai. Uh, so that's already acknowledged, although it's informally acknowledged and it, it hasn't been, I don't believe it's been formally acknowledged, but certainly informally acknowledged and discussed. So, um, so I guess it, it's if we can tie them all together and bring the work forward and get the, the complete um, upgrade done sooner rather than later, then um, that's really where I kind of left it with Keith. Um, and that's the way it's reflected in the report. Um, so, Mr Chair, that's kind of the background I can provide to this. Right, Matt, and while you've got... The, uh, while you're speaking just at the moment, um, Kevin, if in fact we were to recommend pulling it forward, what's the uh, what's the implication on the council's budget long-term plan and does that come at the cost of something else or is there room to absorb it if it's brought forward? So look, it will, as things stand, and Alison, I'll hand over to Alison in a minute, but as things stand, we would not be able to afford to fund this um, by ourselves. There has been some discussions around funding from central government in some shape or form. Um, and uh, I, you know, I believe, and obviously, obviously um, Sleepyhead 2 would obviously be a key player as well in terms of um, in terms of. Uh, contributing to this. That still needs to all be sorted out. But look, um, I'll hand over to Alison because she'll be able to give you more perspective on that. Thanks, Gavin. Alison, welcome. Hi, um, thanks for having me. Uh, just wanted to, um, I guess, traverse some discussions that we've already had with Sleepyhead before the proposed district change process. So we spoke to them very early on about the fact that our debt cap would not allow us to actually expand our operations to incorporate their area um, and that that would require a conversation with Crown Infrastructure Partners so they are aware that our balance sheet as council cannot take the investment to support a Hinawai um, and that is largely I mean it is growth it's not we've got the budget to support the existing um, connections and the upgrade but we haven't got it for the growth aspects um, and we probably did incorporate some growth in terms of Kainga Ora's development, but not the Hinawai space. Um, so we are about to engage with them on the development agreement process. Um, and I, we are engaging a specialist to come and help through those discussions because it's become quite obvious that Sleepyhead haven't been in this space before. So we will be reaching out to Crown Infrastructure Partners in the first instance to see how they can help um, perhaps get this development off the ground and um, they would have to come to the party if we wanted to bring that work forward. Alison, just a question from me before we open it wider. Is, is, would this potentially be a candidate for the July funding through the Three Waters? So I guess the, the challenge there is that uh, this is part of the now better off funding package um, and not all of our district is connected to water or wastewater services so to say you're going to put that money into those services would be a real challenge for existing ratepayers 
Um, so that's probably where we would get pushback. We have a strong federated farmers presence um, who, of course, aren't connected into those services. So mm. um, I guess a portion could be, but, um, yeah, it would, it would need to be agreed to. Thank you. Councillor Patterson, Eugene, do you want to make a comment just before we open it up for further discussion? I'm a councillor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, probably just um, um, going on what Gavin had um, mentioned, that there is um, the support at the governance level to look at bringing this forward. Um, we definitely haven't discussed. We know that there is um, funding restraints and hopefully we can work with um, central government on bringing some funding um, in our direction. Um, and also, um, I mean, probably Alison's covered it off with the, with the sleepy head and hopefully be able to have, have further discussions with them to see um, what funding mechanisms we can bring forward. But um, council's informal um, discussions was that um, we support bringing it forward if we can find some funding solutions and we don't yeah. see it um, that logical as investing a million dollars into some temporary upgrade. Thank, thank you for that and noting all we're being asked to explore the opportunity with that comment. Let me open it up for any um, questions or comments from board members who would like to speak first. Garth, anything from your perspective? Uh, well, I guess it's about timing, isn't it? So, I mean, I don't know when Sleepy Head are looking to actually progress or when they'll need to have their you know, water treatment, best water treatment capability available to them. So what's the gap? Is it five years? Is it 10 years? Uh, and if it's a longer period of time, then, you know, what are you going to do with the only water treatment plant um, not compliance issue? Because I'm not sure that's sustainable for a long period of time. So I'm just not sure. I have no timeline here. I don't know what by when. Um, I guess that's one thing. The other thing is I'm assuming that you know, is Sleepy Head actually locked and loaded to build everything? Or are they, you know, are these big developers or organ private organisations like Sleepy Head, we deal with them all the time, have got great plans, but often they never fully develop uh, their plans. So you know, what can be expected? Is there some, some rebel room here that they sort of go, I actually won't do res, we'll just do the factory? I don't know. I mean, I'm just, because I'm, not across some of that sort of stuff. And if they do that, then what's the implication on the um, water treatment plant and subsequent subsequent consents and things like that. So I, I guess I just, I, uh, a timeline would be really helpful. Um, I'd like to, and obviously then how, what period of time is the uh, company going to be non-compliant? I think there's three questions buried there. Who can, who can Carol, can you field those? One is um, length of time that, uh, Company would be non-compliant. Second is uh, what's how firm or otherwise is Sleepy Head in terms of the commitment and the timing of when uh, the requirement, the demand would be there. Um, yep, I can give that a go. So the short-term solution um, that the one minute would be compliant a lot sooner. If it's a full upgrade, it's potentially a, a three-year. Time frame. I've just pulled up the um, high level time frame that um, Sleepyhead gave to us. So the phone factory building complete first quarter of 2023, manufacturing facility um, first stage 2023, third stage 25, service centre 24, if that's the wider, initial general industrial finished 2024, and initial residential up to 50 units 2025. So that is quite soon that their, their indicative time frame is. And at what point do they need the capacity from the wastewater treatment plant? Is that at the first stage with the foam factory or at a later point? At a later point. Um, so they can do, I think, the first two stages. Um, by 2024, they would need the, a compliant um, wastewater and, and water public reticulated to connect to. So just pretty soon. So, I mean, the, the practicality of that, of everything you've talked about in two years, really? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Do I find that very hard to kind of reconcile? Two years, and it's like from, and we're already in March 2022. So 18 months, you're going to have all this done. 
you're dreaming. Yeah, that, that's the timeline that they've given no, us. Yeah, no, but it's, that's, I mean, I get these sorts of timelines all the time. I mean, you know, you can add three years to that. Betcha. Gavin? So, look, there's a, there's a few questions here, but, um, look, that's their ideal timeline. Um, obviously... Um, that requires us to bring forward the upgrade of Huntley. Um, and that and that obviously, is, as we know, will take time. We've seen that with Te Kofata. So it will take time. I've got no doubts about that. Um, one of the questions you asked, Garth, was how serious are Sleepyhead? The answer is very serious. They've already invested millions and millions of dollars. Um, so, and they, the whole plan... Um, hinges upon the foam factory's first stage, but everything else they've invest they have invested in very heavily as well in terms of the negotiations through the district plan process and all those kind of things. So I don't have any doubts about how serious they are, but yes, I don't have a signed piece of paper either that that would say you know we could go ahead and commit that money now we'd have to we obviously have to work through that process with them but i guess what what i've seen today is about is um is it worth having this conversation first with the regional council to see the opportunity to go for the big solution or do we have to do the interim solution now um and then schedule to get on with a long-term solution next year or something along those lines that i think is probably the fundamental yeah I, 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 I don't know the answer to that at the moment because i haven't had that conversation with the regional council and yet. totally agree with you gavin i mean that's what i'm just trying to understand do you need to go hard now or can, have you got time and i mean oh, i i can't answer that question i don't i mean in in terms of developing a big factory that's not going to happen overnight um and, the, the, you know, to build 50 houses or to get all that development work, 50 houses done. I mean, they haven't, I mean, they've done some earthworks, but it's only to do with the foam factory so far. I've put a power supply into the foam factory only. Um, they're a fair ways off. And if you're talking two years, I mean, I, I, I mean, in the current climate, I mean, I'm just finding that hard to reconcile compared with what other people, other developers are doing in our community. These guys might be different. I, I guess I'm just testing the timing because if you if you get jammed into a corner time wise, which is kind of what you seem to be saying, then um, you know you it makes it yeah. you know you've got to make some really quick kind of decisions and start this process now. Where do you get a bit of time to think about it and you know push the sleepy head a little bit more around their, their schedule and what they're up to and I don't know. It just I guess there's no harm no foul starting early, but it, I I just the development times don't quite align really for me. And I, they're I guess, to go fast. I, I guess if I may, Mr Chair, the other thing we need to keep in mind is the whole reform process as well, mm. because I think obviously you don't want this to become foul of that process. Yeah. Um, if it was left too long and left to the water entities to make the decision, um, would it still be a priority for them? Um, so that's something else that also needs to be factored in. So, look, I know yeah. there's questions to which I don't have the answers, but I just thought that we should start with that conversation with the regional council. And if the answer is no, then um, I think we've got a clear direction from Watercare around what needs to happen and, and where the money needs to be spent now to address the compliance issues. I, 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 if I may, through the chair, I mean, I agree with your approach, Kevin. It makes sense. Um, yep, well, noting those points, um, then Jackie. Um, yeah, I just think it's also worthwhile having a cordial with the local community around what's going on here. So I think it's it's one thing to talk to regional council, but ultimately we'll need a, go th to go through a consenting process for the long-term strategic solution for Babu Pōkeka. And to me, it makes sense to start that now as part, you know, in parallel with your discussions with, with the regional council. Um, I did have some questions around the confidence we might have in the costs that are in the LTP. 
um, given all the changes that we're seeing in the sector and, and everywhere, and whether you know forty-six million dollars sounds like a lot, um, but in the current environment, uh, is it enough? I wonder whether, whether we need to have a closer look at that. Um, and then I also would be keen to understand the risks of proceeding with an upgrade ahead of having started the consenting process for the long-term solution. I know we're doing it at Te Kauwhata. Um, there's some, I guess, I think a lot more urgency at Te Kauwhata, um, but yeah, just really would like the risks to be highlighted in any paper that comes to the board around timing of those sorts of decisions. Um, I agree with Garth around the timing. To me, if I've picked up on Carolyn's um, presentation correctly, they're pretty good to go for their initial stages around on-site treatment. Um, and so I wonder what the trigger for connecting to the Huntley plant really is and how, how long that might take in reality. So yeah, a lot, a lot more questions than, than answers from me. Okay, I think um, we've got a range of questions that need to be handled. Is there any further comments, any other new issues? If not, I think when I look back at the recommendation, everything that's been raised is consistent with the recommendations that we're looking to explore the opportunity. There's a number of issues that the governance board would want brought back to it, ranging from um, uh, what the response of the regional council is, Gavin quite rightly says, that'll essentially determine one way or the other, but if it is a goer then how does it fit alongside the timing, the funding of it, as Jackie mentions, and equally um, parallel consultations with the community. So on the basis of that, are we prepared to move the recommendations to allow, at this stage, not to approve the um, short-term fix, but to look to continue to explore the opportunity uh, to bring forward the funding and would we look to have a paper brought back to us at the next um, meeting, given the relative urgency of reaching a decision one way or the other? Gavin? Thank you, Chair. Gar, sorry. I'm just, just thinking about it. I mean, I think it's all that information would be really valuable. And then also um, the um, some sort of a cost return on doing a early or cost can return comparison on doing a sort of temporary upgrade at Huntley to manage compliance in the short term. If that could be added, that would be useful, I think. Yeah, you, you see what I mean? Like you could spend a million dollars. Say, say this thing is four or five years off, it might be cost effective to actually solve the compliance problem, you know, up front. I don't know. Um, yeah, I would agree with you there equally, getting, and I would tag on to that the opportunity cost if in fact um, it may well be that it's worth doing the short term, given what might well be foregone um, yes. to bring the capital forward. Yeah. Mr. Chair, if I may, um, that, that makes sense. The other question that still remains unanswered is if we do spend the million dollars, where is it funded from? Because we don't have an answer to that question yet either. Mm -hmm. All right. So that also needs to be resolved soon. Right, we add that one to the, the list. Are we comfortable to take the resolution now? I mean, I will read through it all. It's sitting on page 183. Um, I can see Garth moving. I'm happy to second. All in favour? Right. And Carol, the action out of it is to bring back a report at the next meeting with as much of the information as you're able to um, gather in relation to what's been raised today, given the urgency. Right. Three Waters Governor's Report, Agenda Item 6.2, page 59. Let's find it. Assume the other map that you are presenting. You can assume we take it as red, but what would you like to highlight for us? 
Absolutely. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, yeah, as you said, uh, taking the reporter's read, uh, so just a few highlights to discuss was around uh, all performance measures for the year to date are achieved. Uh, so that's continuing well. Um, we did have some challenges in uh, January, but again, similar to December, that was due to a low number of jobs uh, that, that really can skew the numbers quite significantly. Um, the other key points that we talked about in, were in the actions was around COVID and the ongoing actions that we're doing there. So um, just as an update to, to the board, so so you're aware, so we are doing uh, surveillance uh, testing of all the critical staff and staff that engage with them now. Uh, so that's once a week testing uh, within each, within each individual uh, and across the bubbles that we're operating at the moment to ensure isolation from uh, each other so that we can try to mitigate the impacts of spread. So uh, our, our approach at the stage is to, to as much as possible minimise um, having as many people's, uh, having as few people infected with COVID at the same time. Really, that's the key risk for us, that we have too many people uh, and out at the same time. And that's, to date, been working fairly well. We have had cases, obviously, um, unfortunately, but, um, but nothing has spread beyond uh, to, to wider teams as we've seen in other businesses. Uh, for staff uh, that are identified as close contacts, which was another key risk around the situation where actually they're completely, they're, 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 they're fine to work, but due to being in close contact, they are, they're at risk. So in those that situation, staff are uh, doing daily rats tests prior to starting work, just to ensure that they have uh, they are not infected before they start work, just to allow us to continue operating the businesses as smoothly as we can during this time. We're also having staff from Auckland um, who are identified as reserves, we've called them, uh, come down to the plants just to see the plants so that they are familiar with them in case that we diff, in case we do need to call on any staff from Auckland to come down. It would be, um, I think we all agreed a bit unfair to just have them turn up and expect to understand the plants. So we're, we're arranging, uh, we're continuing to do uh, visits with some staff to come down and have a look at the plants so they understand them if they are called on. Um, uh, we did have a, 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 an unfortunate event where we were doing drone surveying in the uh, Mary Mary and Tikofida area. This was the second tranche of um, drone surveying that was done. Unfortunately, there was a lack of communication associated with that, uh, that surveying. The drones themselves don't actually fly over people's private property, but they do flow very close to them. Uh, and unfortunately, the, the communication what, uh, requirements weren't followed around notifying the community. We've worked uh, closely with the council on that, have apologised to the community uh, and uh, ensuring that we improve that and for any future drone surveying that we do. Uh, so that's to identify leaks. Uh, the cyclone event, as we're all aware, was uh, quite a significant event, uh, specifically for ourselves, um, as, as Garth can probably attest, due to the, the power of impacts that we had across the region, which were quite significant. So thankfully, we didn't have rain at the same time at the event, which would have created uh, quite, quite significant issues. Um, unfortunately, we also had a SCADA outage at the same time, um, which, which, uh, which essentially to a large degree can blind the team to what's happening across the network. So um, obviously, as you're aware um, from the other projects, the SCADA project is progressing and, and that, that will be transferred over in July, July and August, and that should hopefully give us uh, more resilience in the system, which would be great for especially, especially during events like that. Um, but the cyclone event was quite significant. We've had a uh, post-event uh, incident review uh, with a number of actions, including uh, more permanent generators at, at key plants, just to ensure that we can manage the impact of events like that um, in the future and ensure services continue. With all of that in mind, um, the event was managed exceptionally well by the team and we only had one customer which is Sinlay actually infected uh, uh, affected at all during the event so it was a, an amazing job done by the team. Uh, we've also uh, recently just uh, worked with with the council around uh, restrictions across the uh, across the Waikato region. I think that's been really successful. So um, historically, the council and uh, surrounding councils were aligned to Hamilton Hamilton City Council with uh, and their restriction approach, which was based on the the water supply within Hamilton City Council. 
we've worked with the, uh, the Waters team and the comms team to, to talk about options around how we can do it on more of a supply-based, catchment-based approach. Um, and that's been very successful, I think. We haven't uh, had to enforce any restrictions or trigger any restrictions this summer event. And it has been a dry summer again, um, other than the southern region supplied by Hamilton City Council. Um, and we'll continue with that approach uh, just to ensure that when we do uh, when we do trigger restrictions, they actually have that the, the, the desired outcome, which is to change behaviours and restrict behaviours. Uh, obviously, throughout that whole time, we're still continuing to do conservation messages and, and asking uh, residents and across the district to control and, and, and reduce their usage wherever possible uh, versus actually going to formal restrictions and, and starting to cut off behaviours like sprinklers, et cetera, and, and even greater restrictions. Um, so other than that, it's, it's uh, yeah, I think Omnicron has been obviously one of the key key events in ensuring that the business is operating correctly throughout that period. And, and as you said, uh, taking the rest of the paper, it was read, but happy to take questions. Okay, thank you, Matt. Um, Eugene, Councillor Patterson. Yep, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is probably, I'd just like to highlight at the start, this is um, my son does work for Watercare and has been working here for the last couple of years. Um, but this is something that's not come from him, and it's sort of to, um, to Matt, um, is this, um, I was put on a call or had a call last Friday, conference call, and it come from some senior staff within, um, what would you say, the Brownlee Ave, the, the field team, um, which highlighted some concerns I'd heard about this some months ago, but it's around um, their... Um, wastewater allowances and that, that they believe that they've been owed for 12 months, um, for the last 12 months that they've not been getting paid and I've raised that. And Matt, you not, may not be aware of it because it, they relate it back to a um, some staff in your team at Tirapa there that are not following this through. So look, I, I just want to make it clear, this is what I've heard from one side. So I just want Matt to hopefully follow it up as an action and, and provide that back. They were well aware that there was a sport meeting today, hence why they um, rang me on Friday. So their, their issue is around the water wastewater allowance that they believe has been um, owed to them. They've talked to that with staff at Tarapa on a number of occasions, and it just keeps getting brushed off and brushed off. Their thought is, you know, we all talk about this COVID and the hardships and the times they're having. They are also in the same situation, and so feel as though if they're owed that money, they should be paid that accordingly. Um, also, they did want to highlight that they believe that they've got a very good team. Um, these are from senior staff members who have been there for a long time and believe that they probably at this current stage, they've probably got the best they've had for a long, long time. So, you know, they're not, they're not all negative, but they're just feeling as though they're getting hammered. And so um, they just wanted this to raise because they feel as though also, um, I've taken down a few notes here, um, but believe that some of the pay structures, which is, I don't know nothing how that works, but some of the pay structures that are happening within there um, are quite selective on who gets those pay structures accordingly to who's who in there sort of thing. And some people should be paid better than what they are for the, for the duties they do. That's aside from the wastewater allowance. So... I just wanted to highlight because the concerns I have is that um, in this day and age, um, we have staffing is very, very hard and, and to retain staff right across the board, no matter what industry you're in, is holding back money that so to them is pretty unjust. Um, you know, we do not need to create a negative environment in that field because we have got a very good team from all accounts. Um, and also, um, I... I did raise this with my son on Monday, on Sunday actually, and just ask, is there is there some truth to it? He he believed there was, um, and I think it's right across the board. But he said more so. His thing is, and he won't be one of these ones because he's only just pretty new at it and got not many tickets, I'd say at this stage. But he said, you know, they're getting shoulder tapped all of the time. Some of these senior staff um, to and to go into some private um, work or been offered offered employment. Um, he said the thing that's probably keeping them there is they do love the environment and their working environment that they work in and, and the, the group or the camaraderie they have amongst themselves. But he said he thought it was a concern that, um, you know, when things are not getting done and they're not getting heard, that um, some people might just 
bite the bullet and move on. And I think they believe that they're very understaffed. If you look at it on a ratio, um, on a scale, compared to Auckland and uh, water care in Auckland. So they believe that they are definitely punching above their, above their weight and um, believe something should be done, hence why they asked me to raise this today. And just hope that Matt, you could just follow it through and maybe bring it back as an action. As I said, I don't know what, what lies behind that and if they are entitled to those, but they strongly believe they are. They have engaged with their union delegates to follow this on and push it further. So I just think that we should probably try to clear it up if there is something there to be sorted. No, no, thank you, Councillor Patterson. I really appreciate the feedback. Um, we have, you may or may not be aware, we've just recently completed uh, union negotiations. So um, let, let me look into that. And um, so at this stage, I'm certainly, you know, any remuneration that somebody is owed, they'll receive. So I'm, I need to understand what the feeling is and what it's related to. But once I understand that, I'll come back and, and give you an update as well as speak to the team, definitely. Yeah, and, and I think originally they, they were told that, you know, if there was anything they owed, they would be back paid to that to the time that it was was owed to them. Um, I think that what they've been saying, though, is that the um, staff within Tarapa have been using COVID as an excuse where they believe it's not an excuse anymore. This should be, be able to be dealt with online emails etc so i just wanted to highlight that and yeah no thanks Councillor. thank you Chair. um carol i think the action point out of that is to seek assurance from water care services that all contractual entitlements are being met um, in a timely fashion i think also buried in that was a question around staffing but i'll leave that with uh, staff mm -hmm. levels matt for you to respond back accordingly yeah. Right, back to your report. Any questions from board members? Comments? Nothing from Garth, I see, Jackie. Yeah, just one question from me, um, and it's in relation to the Te Kaufata wastewater consent. Just wanting an update on how the discussions with Ngamuka have gone. Um, I know there was some correspondence in relation to appointment of external resources to assist with, with the consenting process. Can we get an update on where, where that's at? I'll probably hand that over to Carol to in, re in regards to the, that, sorry. Yep. I, I was just gonna say, um, in, uh, I think it's in PEX, there is a paper, um, I want to show the end of the open one, it was a supplementary agenda item. Um, on that topic specifically and um, with the meeting that we attended, Steve Howard, who's on, on the um, call now, and also Keith Martin attended with the, the Namilka Development Trust. So Carol, we are going to put that point up in the closed agenda. Is that what you're saying? Uh, uh, mine should be open, is it? Um, it's, the, it's the last paper in the open. It's yeah, the last open. Yeah, where that would be discussed and Let's yeah. hop through from there because certainly I think a number of us are wanting assurance that the agreements entered into the AMUCA are being honoured in terms of consultation before decisions are taken. But let's pick it up as that, that agenda item. Any other questions? If not, I've just got one for Matt. I see we're doing one test per week, one rat test of the critical workers. Is that actually sufficient? Because I'm certainly working with other construction sites, for example, that are doing daily rat tests to provide the level of assurance? Uh, so it, it's a great question. So obviously, if anybody feels unwell, then they, they'll do a rat's test as well. Um, but what we've got operating at the moment, in particular, an example with the networks team is they're operating in three teams, uh, three teams of three or four. So each of those individuals on different days is doing the test. So effectively, we're almost testing the individual bubbles uh, three to four times a week. Um, so they're not all doing it on the same day. So that's the approach we've taken at this stage. Um, so far, it's been quite effective. We've, we've identified individuals before they've come into work when they've had COVID and, um, and been able to, to, to stop them working. And for the, the close contacts, it's also been quite effective um, to do the daily testing for those individuals. So at this stage, it, it's, it's the approach that we're taking seems to be working, yes. Certainly not, a, certainly not on a basis of reducing how many rats tests we use. It's, it's just around the logic of why we're using them. All right, I think for that, unless there's any further comments or being asked to note, 
uh, that the Three Waters Governance Report for March 2022 is received. So someone to move that. Moved by Gavin, seconded by Garth, all in favor, all right, carried. All right, 6.3, Tiakau Water Supply Options Assessment. Carol, are you um, presenting that? Um, Hermanis is um, from Becca, who's been um, working for us, helping if that's going to present that one, so I'll hand you over to Hermanis. Right, I think just before you start, I think I would note, I saw, um, uh, Mr. Wilson coming, did I see him coming on? Yes. Right, so I'm just sorry about that, Mr. Wilson. I was just acknowledging that you are on this call. Um, and I, as I communicated back in email, thanked you for your um, information that you provided to us ahead of this discussion. So with that note, we'll hand across for the, the presentation. Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, so this paper covers um, some options that we looked at going forward for the Tiako water scheme. Um, so this is currently a small water scheme, a closed scheme. And um, with the newest changes uh, through Tumata Arawai, um, council would like to retain the scheme, but in order to make sure that is the right decision. We have looked at different options. Um, so we want to do the best thing for the community. So we have looked at tankering and we have looked at uh, piping under the harbor and we have looked at rainwater tanks um, that are um, on site at each household. Um, the best of these uh, in terms of, of for the community, we believe is to upgrade and um, we have not secured funding for this as of yet. Um, so in parallel with uh, what we'd like to request, which is approval from the board to engage with the community on these solutions and get a affirmation from the community on the way forward. Uh, in parallel to that, uh, council will be seeking funding and uh, working out how that will be funded, uh, given that there is a shortfall from what is currently assigned to the scheme, although originally assigned to a different purpose. I also wanted to add that um, in terms of this new scheme, it would require drilling of a new bore um, if we went with the upgrade option. So, um, we are entirely, uh, this is a supply that has been used for years with great success. Um, so with that in mind um, and the current bore's shell casing being damaged, um, we would not be pursuing reinstating the previous bore and no changes to the previous bore given the casing's damage would have uh, successfully brought it up to spec, it needs to be redrilled, given that we believe that the wall casing uh, breaking was the reason for previous raw water quality issues. So um, that's really the gist of it in a high level. And uh, we would like to seek your approval to speak to the community and um, noting to the community as well that this would be a community service to all and that it would be a all in um, option uh, for that community around the cost and the upgrade that would be required and the level of service that we'd want to give them. Okay, thank okay. you. Thank you for that. Um, before we open it up for um, discussion amongst the directors, um, Mr. Wilson, um, given that you've taken the trouble to write into us, uh, I'd just like to give you an opportunity in five minutes or less if there are any key points that you would just like to present ahead of our discussion, but please keep it brief. You're on mute. We think that, um, that the report that Hermanus has put together has been very thorough. Can you hear me? Yes, yep. Yeah. <laughs> um, and probably where we sit with uh, really the main concerns going forward is that in the page um, or next steps is seven, and it's on page 89 of the, of the agenda. 
it's actually recommended to be sampling the water prior to to re-establishing or re-drilling the bore. Um, that, that runs counter to all the other uh, recommendations. Uh, it's it's um, what I wanted to just uh, very quickly clarify was that it is about the intent, um, not the small details. There may be one or two little details like that where one would have to drill it first before doing the sampling. You are 100% correct there. So sorry about that minor error. Okay, look, could I um, avoid a debate or discussion going on? So back to Mr. Wilson, just let you present your key points and then we'll open it up yeah. for discussion. That, that would be the main key point going forward. And then obviously for us as a community, when, um, when Hermanus mentions the all-in solution um, or option, um, it really comes down to what that's going to mean for the community in regard to um, the cost of establishment and mm. how we all move forward uh, together. Oh, thanks for that. And if I can add to the information yeah. you've provided, so we've got it on record, I think you were raising some concerns around the maintenance that was done on the previous four as being a, um, at least the contributing to the situation we're in now. And I think there was some you were making some points around the costs if in fact the um, rainwater tanks were brought into account, but those are all issues no doubt the team can pick up when they, they do the review. So with that, um, open it up for comments, questions. Gavin, anything from your perspective? Um, nothing specific. I, I think the report's quite clear about what the options are. Um, and I think it's, as we talked on the previous item, it really is about having the conversation with the community first and seeing where that leads us. Absolutely. Jackie, from your perspective, any questions at this stage? No, I'm, I'm happy with the recommendations. Thank you, Mr Chair. And Garth? No, likewise, so it was a good report and happy with the recommendations. And equally so from me. So we're, we're on page 77, I think we've got recommendations there to carry out that community engagement. I'm sure, Mr Wilson, at that point, any of the issues that your uh, um, team, your group wish to will be made. And um, equally, we will take into account any of the issues that may have one way or another been uh, not fully accounted for. So at this stage, we're being asked to undertake community engagement. Um, we're noting that uh, there's a strong preference from either option two or four, and um, equally where uh, your preferences. So with that in mind, I'm happy to move the recommendation. Do I have a seconder? Seconded by Garth, all in favor? All right, thank you. Um, everyone and equally Mr Wilson thank you very much for coming on the call today yeah. right water filling stations page 168 agenda item 6.4 find it <laughs> Oh, I, uh, thank you, uh, Chair. So um, just uh, again, taking the paper as read, um, as, as you're all aware, Te Mata new standards are due in July. And one of those uh, clear standards is the use around hydrants and standpipes going forward, uh, which, which uh, at the stage will not be acceptable. And we don't see any reason for that, that to change between now and then. Uh, so there was budget allowed allowed for to implement uh, permanent filling stations, and this paper is to uh, to uh, begin access and and begin the work around creating those permanent filling stations. The filling stations themselves, whilst uh, they can be expensive uh, due to telemetry and SCADA activities, uh, are a fairly standard design. Uh, the locations is probably the thing that we have the most challenge with about identifying appropriate locations and then working with the alliance team around roading requirements and how that's going to be. I do apologise, there is uh, one um, 
one element of the paper that has been transcribed. So the, the actual funding uh, is for $306,000 for the filling stations themselves and $180,000 for the location identification and near, any improvements improvements required for roading. So that, that was transposed, so apologies. Um, but as per the paper, the recommendation is for the, uh, the budget allocation to be utilised to um, begin the work around the cre creation of the three filling stations. Um, happy to take any questions around the paper. Right. Any questions, comments? Fairly clear. I'm not seeing anyone put their hands up. So, Matt, I think you can take that as a vote of endorsement. Thank you. There. So we can move the, the recommendation is sitting on page 168. Oh, I'm happy to move it, Mr. Chair. Moved by Gavin, seconded by Garth. Excellent. All in favour? Aye. Carried. And that, Carol, I think brings us to the last agenda item, which is being circulated under separate cover 6.6 .6, to help at a wastewater treat plant, treatment plant consent application. Um, are you talking to that, Carol? Um, I'm going to let uh, Stephen Howard from Waterkey talk to that, who attended the meeting with um, Keith Martin. So I'll hand you over to Steve. All right, Steve, welcome. I am here. Thanks, Carol. You can hear me? Indeed, we can. Okay, cool. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, so there was, um, I will take the paper as read and just draw out some key points, particularly what um, Jackie was interested in. Um, so, with the, so, this has come about with the expiry of the consent in 2027, the TK consent, but there is 2024, um, there's obligations within the existing consent for a 2024 date of re um, lim um, removing the co-mingling of, of waters with the TK water, wastewater con treatment consultation group. So there's several, so with the, so it's prudent to do some consenting now. We're just sort of um, getting some consent application preparation now. We're at the very, very early stage of forming a team, but there is several streams that we need to um, consult with in terms of our key partners, which is, includes the TK Water Association, um, Mano Whenua, and new and new people and new comers, new people, new 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 key stakeholders to T Kofoda that may not have been around in the earlier part. So all of this will be led by WDC, and all the buck stops with um, the WDC Pohonu Iwi Ki Tihapari, which is Sam Tuka. So enabling Sam to have the resources to do it. Oftentimes he's triple triple booked with, and but he is um, very offers very wise counsel and is and is critical to this project. So as part of enabling um, resourcing and ensuring that Hapu are empowered and um, with this project, it was initial steps were to engage some support there by a tikanga specialist. Um, again it was it was um, just trying to set up a platform to thrive upon a foundation. And again, it was the um, I can it needed a bit of a reset with with Hapu because it was again it was noted that it comes from a good place, but there seem but from Hapu's perspective, there always seems to be a, a recurring theme of Hapu being told what is good for them mm. rather than being um, at the initial stages of setting up. Almost, um, it's a, a not a, a not a good scene. So we again, it was a, a real good. A real healthy meeting and a chance just to reset it where it was quite short notice but to go to the Namoka meeting was really really excellent and um it was because it was short notice sam and julian sam couldn't come um but uh it really did offer keith a good opportunity to introduce himself as wdc water manager and just reassure him that we're all in and we're going to work together and get a platform together that everyone understands and can work towards um not just Meeting the, I mean, we have we have to meet RMA needs, but it's more, it's more about the um, the strengthening of the relationship, getting an application together that everyone can can be can participate in and feel supported toward. And um, I guess the the main thing that came out of it was, yep, 
we, we we're, we're in a good place now we can we can move forward with this and and i think that uh there's more opportunity to go to now more meeting with invites and room to for water governance put to strengthen their relationship too if it want they really appreciated keith um happy really appreciated keith's presence and ongoing commitment so it's, the paper has released an update on those points well thank you for that uh, with those comments i'll open it up for any uh uh, comment, Jackie, do you want to um, follow up on the concern you raised earlier on the, the other agenda item? So I guess for me, uh, before I start, just as noted in my um, declarations of interest, I am part of Namuka, mm -hmm. uh, just for the record. Um, but what I really want to make sure of is that we are moving forward um, because I feel like we had uh, the beginnings of this sort of conversation about two, two years ago now. Um, so really just looking for some comfort that we are on the right track. Um, and I do think that there would be value in yourself, Mr. Chair, um, attending, you know, the next Ngamuka hui, maybe not every hui, um, but, you know, having a regular... Um, not a regular, but, you know, turning up to some of those hui so that we are engaging directly with mana whenua there, given the, the history. Yeah. So, yeah, my question is really, where, where to from, from here um, to build on, I guess, the, the good hui that you attended, Steve, um, and to make sure that we are actually moving forward together and I guess just adding to that from the chair, um, Jackie, to firstly say yes, obviously more than happy to attend a meeting and just to acknowledge that some concern that we were taking, starting to put arrangements into place without prior consultation with Namuku, which seemed to me to go across the grain of the um, discussion and arrangement we'd met now two years ago with Namuku. So, but... The key thing is the way forward from here. And, and certainly what I'm hearing from what Steve has said is that um, we've now gone some ways to have that um, consultation. It's yeah, correct. I don't know if Steve wanted to comment on that. No, that, that's correct. If it was just assurance that things are progressing, definitely, definitely it is the case. And there's just, um, I think some of the, Again, two years ago, it was um, we're talking. We were, it was looking at the treatment, and I guess it was just bringing together. There had been a lot of work done prior to to getting securement of a, a state of the art technology through HIF funding, etc. Maybe it hasn't been recognised, but it was again four years ago. There wasn't. There was no way affordability for something like that to hit for a small council like. WDC to afford. It's gone great steps towards that. Now we're now we're moving. Now we just gotta use that new technology and just make sure that the bottom lines for Hapu and key stakeholders are met, which is um, a land discharge, which I think there there is ability to move forward on that. Hmm. Evan. Um, so Mr. Chair, all I wanted to just comment on was that um, as a result of some of the discussions I know that led up to this uh, hui that Stephen and, and Keith attended. Um, I did suggest and did email the board members and just say, look, uh, let's take the opportunity to try and tee up and arrange um, a, a hui for the board, either through Namuka's monthly meeting or some separate um, discussion. And I know that Keith has raised that. Uh, I haven't got any dates yet or any suggested dates, but certainly we are trying to make sure that um, the connection remains um, and grows. So, Thank you. Right. And we obviously all share that desire. Is there any, any further comment on this paper? If not, I think we can take the recommendation, which is on page a numbered page, about two in. But we received the uh, consent application for pitch a preparation project and that we consult with Mana Whenua 
based on sincerity, respect, and aspiration for delivering the best practical discharge option. I'm certainly more than happy to move that resolution. Do I have a seconder? Gavin, all in favor? Passed. Excellent. Thank you for that. I think that brings us to the um, end of the open agenda. Um, I'm going to suggest we take a break, but Matt, I, th I think we need to move the motion initially, do we, to go into the closed session? Oh, I'm seeing a hand up, moving the resolution. Right, short circuiting, Gavin, seconded by Garth. 